Welcome to the Physics Classroom's video tutorial on momentum and collisions. The topic of this video is solving problems using momentum conservation. And here's what we wish to learn. What exactly is meant by the law of conservation of momentum and how can we use this law in order to analyze and solve physics word problems? I'm Mr. H. Let's get started. In a previous video, this one, I discussed the law of momentum conservation, which states that for any collision occurring in an isolated system, the total amount of momentum possessed by objects within that system is conserved or remains unchanged. For the collision depicted here in the before-after diagram, we could consider this to be an isolated system as long as the only unbalanced forces acting upon the objects at collision time are the forces between the objects themselves. If we do a quick momentum analysis using the equation momentum equal mass times velocity, we'll find that momentum is indeed conserved. For the red cart before the collision, the momentum is 2 times 4 mass times velocity. That's 8. And for the blue cart, it's 1 times 1. The total momentum before the collision is 9 units of momentum. After the collision, we can do the same analysis. For the red cart, it's 2 times 3, and that's 6. And for the blue cart, it's 1 times 3, and that's 3. The total is 6 plus 3 after the collision. That's a total of 9 units of momentum. It's the same before as after the collision. It's not that the red cart conserves its own momentum. A matter of fact, it loses 2 units of momentum. Nor does the blue cart conserve its momentum. In fact, it gains 2 units of momentum. But the total amount contained within the system is 9 before. That's what gets conserved. The total amount of momentum possessed by objects within the system is conserved during such a collision. Here is the collision we just discussed. In calling the red cart and blue cart an isolated system, we're saying that it does not transfer any of its combined momentum to objects outside of it, nor do objects outside the system transfer momentum to the red and the blue cart. Thus, the system conserves its momentum of 9 units. This is a valid assumption. As long as the only forces acting upon red or blue cart are forces between those red and blue carts themselves, internal forces. If objects external to the system act to supply unbalanced forces up on the red or the blue cart, then it cannot be considered an isolated system and total momentum would not be conserved. So let's look at the red and the blue cart in more detail. For the red cart, what we notice is that there's three forces. There's a normal force and a gravity force. Those are external forces, but they balance each other. And the third force is the force of the blue cart pushing backwards up on the red cart. That's an internal force and won't destroy momentum conservation. For the blue cart, there's also three forces. Two of them are external forces, but they balance. Normal and gravity balance each other. The third force is the force of the red cart pushing the blue cart forward. That's an internal force, but internal forces don't change the total momentum of the system. I like to think of a money transfer analogy to help me understand the idea of an isolated system. Here's Eddie, and Eddie wishes to purchase an A. He's got $80. The teacher has $20. The teacher says it's going to cost you $50. Bucks. So Eddie pulls out $50 and hands it to the teacher. And the teacher's money now goes up to $70, and Eddie's goes down to $30. But if you look at these numbers, what you'll notice is that before the interaction, there were 100 units of money in the system. And after, there were 100 units of money in the system. As long as there's no external influences, the system can be considered isolated. And there's no transfer of money across the boundary that includes Eddie and the teacher. Now we could look at this as going down a little differently. Let's just say Eddie begins to pull out the money and transfer it to the teacher. But Jolene is sitting there and sees this going on and says, oh, poor Eddie, I feel so bad for him. He works so hard. And Jolene says, let me pitch in a little bit. And so she throws some money into this interaction, into the system. That's an external influence. And the result is that the total amount of money won't be conserved. There'll be more money when the interaction's over than before the interaction started. Or maybe Joe sees this going on and Joe says to himself, oh, lunch money, lunch money. And Joe says, I got to get me some of that. So he sticks his filthy hands into the pot and pull some money out. Well, that's again an external influence and momentum would, or money would not be conserved. So whenever you have this situation of there's external influences happening, a third party force is going on, we could say that money or momentum would not be conserved by the system. 
Now this tutorial is all about solving momentum conservation problems, so of course it would be helpful to have some equations. So I'm going to give you two. Here we have a collision between two objects, call it object one, blue cart, red cart, and you see the velocities before the, the collision and the velocities after the collision. They're marked V1 and V2 before, and if you notice after, they're marked V1 prime and V2 prime. I call that little raised apostrophe or dash after V1 and V2 after the collision. I call that the prime symbol. Now I'm going to use a momentum table like this one to analyze the collision. So I put momentum values in there. That's mass times velocity. So before the collision, it would look like that. Nothing new here if you've been following this tutorial series. And in the bottom row, what you see is the total, the sum of object 1 plus object 2, m1 times v1 plus m2 times v2. After the collision, it's the same deal. The only difference here is after collision velocities are v1 and v, v1 prime and v2 prime. And in the bottom row, here, you see me adding the parts, the momentum of object 1 plus the momentum of object 2. In the last column, we put the change in momentum, and changes are calculated as after collision minus before the collision. One thing I've done is I factored out the masses from this, so really it's m1 v1 prime minus m1 v1 one, and I just factored out M1, and that's what you get. And what I would expect is that these change values add up to zero. Now I'm going to use this table to derive two equations. Here's the first one. I'm using the bottom row to get this, and I'm saying that the total before equal the total after. Look at the bottom row, look at that, that uh, the bottom row values, look at that equation, and convince yourself that it isn't true. This is my first momentum conservation equation. M1 times V1 plus M2 times V2 equal M1 times the V1 after, V1 prime, plus M2 times the V2 after, V2 prime. Now here's my second equation. This gets a little bit more complicated. Uh, the idea here of the second equation is that the change of object 1's momentum is plus the change of object 2's momentum equals 0. And, and so I just took the change column and I found object 1's change and I added objects 2 change to it. I said that's equal to 0. That's what momentum conservation means, that the, the, the momentum gained by one equal the momentum lost by the other. Now what I can do is I can call this in the first term left side, I can call that inside parentheses stuff the change in the velocity because it's just v1 prime minus v1. That's the change in velocity of object 1. And I can do the same thing to the second term left side. So you see I've done that. I've substituted delta v2 and delta v1 in there. Now what I can do is I can subtract m2 delta v2 from both sides of the equation and I end up with this one. That's the momentum change of object 1 is equal and the negative or opposite of the momentum change of object 2. And that's my second momentum conservation equation. Either two of these equations could be used to solve momentum problems or you can simply use the table. So let's get started on our first example of a momentum problem. So here's my first of three examples. It's about a medicine ball with a mass of 15 kilograms that's thrown with a velocity or speed of 20 kilometers per hour to a person with a mass of 60 kilograms at rest on ice. The person catches the ball and together the person and the ball move with the same speed after the collision and I want to know what that speed is or that velocity is. So I always diagram a before and after collision diagram and in the diagram I put values of M and V so that I know what I, what I know. And I do that before the collision and I do that after the collision and then I have to find out what the V1 prime and V2 prime is. Now I don't know what they are but what I do know is that they are equal to one another. So I'm just going to simplify and say my unknown value is V. It's the V of the ball, it's the V of the person, and I'm trying to find the V. So I begin with a momentum table to organize my solution, and in the table I'm going to put momentum values before and after the collision, and I'm just skipping the change column here. Now, before the collision for the ball, it's 15 times 20, and that's a momentum of 300 units. And for the person, at rest, it's zero. And for the system, I just sum it up, 300 plus zero. So before the collision, there's 300 units of momentum, and if momentum's going to get conserved, there's got to be 300 units of momentum afterwards, which comes from combining the person and the ball's momentum. For the ball, that momentum would be mass times velocity. I don't know what velocity is, so I'm just going to call it V. So I have 15 V, and for the person, it's 60 V. And together, 15 V and 60 V have got to sum to this bottom row, 300. So you'll notice I wrote that out, out 15 V plus 60 V equal 300. That's momentum conservation. Now, I have to solve for V. 
So the algebra goes like this. You combine the term 15v and the term 60v together, and that's 75v, and that's equal to 300. To solve for v, you have to divide both sides of the equation by 75, and you end up with v equal 4 kilometers per hour. Here's my second problem, and it's about a truck that hits a parked car, and I know the mass and the velocity of the truck before the collision. I know the mass of the car. And then after the collision, what I'm told is that the car is set in motion at 12 meters per second, and I'm looking to find the velocity of the truck. So I start with a diagram, and here's my diagram. I'm showing masses and velocities. You notice the car is parked ahead of time, and you notice that after the, the collision, the car is moving, and I know its velocity. I'm looking for the truck's velocity. Here's my momentum table. I have columns for before and columns for after the collision, and rows for the two objects, and one row for the system. Now I'm going to put momentums in there. That's mass times velocity. For the truck before the collision, it's 3,000 multiplied by velocity of 10, and that's 30,000. For the car, it's parked, so its momentum is zero. And the system before the collision is 30,000 units of momentum. After the collision, it has to be momentum being conserved. So after the collision, it's 30,000 units of momentum for the system. That comes from the truck plus the car. And for the truck, I don't know its velocity. So when I write the momentum of the truck, I go mass times velocity, and I'm just going to call the velocity v. So it's 3,000 times v, whatever v is, I'm looking for v. For the car, it's mass times velocity. That's 1,000 times 12. That's 12,000. Now what I know is truck plus car has to equal a total of 30. 30,000. So I'm going to write that out in an equation here. I write 3,000 V plus 12,000 equal 30,000, and I'm solving for V. So the, it's now the problem has come, become an algebra problem. And here's how you do your algebra. Get the 3,000 V by itself on one side of the equation. So you do that by subtracting 12,000 V from both sides. You end up with 3,000 V equal 30,000 minus 12,000. That's 18,000 V. Then divide through by 3,000 to get V by itself, and it's V equal 30,000 divided by, or 18,000 divided by 12,000, pull out your calculator, find out what V is. V ends up being 6, and the unit on V is meters per second in this problem. And I'm tired, and I need to take a nap. So I'm going to have you pause the video, solve this problem, and then when you're done, press play. I'll show you the answer. And if you need a video-guided solution, look in the description section of this video, and you'll see a video explaining how to do this problem. My big hint is pay attention to direction. East is different than west, and so one will have to be called positive and the other negative. Best of luck to you. And here's your answers. If you found this video to be helpful, could you give us a like or subscribe to the channel or leave a question or comment in the comment section below. Here's an action plan, a series of next steps for making your learning stick. You'll find links to each one of these resources in the description of this video. Pick one and give it a try. Whatever you do, I wish you the best of luck. I'm Mr. H, and thank you for watching.